Well, praise the Lord. Thank you so much to our choir, Brother Kerry, and thank you, Instruments of Praise, for leading us in this wonderful time of worship this morning. I enjoyed just singing and hearing you sing about the greatness of our God. Amen? Amen. He is a wonderful Savior, and I am so glad that uh, we have the opportunity and privilege to be able to be in God's house this morning to hear the Word, to share the Word, and uh, also to uh, uh, take care of some very, very important and critical business for the church, and that involves our deacon ministry, and I'm so glad for the men who faithfully serve as deacons here and for their wives and for their families. They are an immense blessing to their pastor. Uh, they bless me in so many ways, I, I cannot tell you. I thank God for each and every one of them, and uh, this is that time of year when you have uh, nominated and presented to us some folks to serve in that ministry for the upcoming uh, time, and so it's my privilege today to recognize them and uh, also to uh, ordain one new deacon who will be coming on to serve with us at uh, Second Baptist. As a matter of fact, we have two new deacons to our church. One has already been ordained in another ministry and has moved here to this area and faithfully serves the Lord now right here with us, but uh, I want to ask you at the very beginning of our time, I was uh, giving a moment for some who are in the choir that are also deacons to be able to get down into the service. But I'm going to ask all of our deacons, all of our men, if you'll just come to the front, all of our deacons, if you'll just join me here at the very front, we're going to begin with this time of ordination. And uh, men, just come. And I want to present to you a wonderful and precious family and a, a young man that uh, has been called to come and serve as a new deacon at uh, Second Baptist Church, and that is uh, Chad Isabel right over here. Chad and his precious wife is Christy. Christy, if you'll come and join Chad, it's our privilege and our joy to be able to ordain uh, Chad to the ministry of deacon, and uh, in a moment our men will pass by to, to pray with him and uh, let him know of their uh, prayers and their love for him. And so, uh, Chad, we are so excited. You know, we love this family. His dad and mom and all of the family are just very precious to me. I thank God for them. And then I also want to mention that we have Blake Harden, who is a deacon already, but a new deacon at Second Baptist Church. And his precious wife is Autumn. Autumn, come and stand with your husband, uh, Blake, today, we are delighted and thrilled to welcome both of these two young men to join with our deacons and be a part of that great ministry. And would you just say thank you to the Lord for calling out these young men to serve our Savior here. Now, in addition, in addition to them, we have some other uh, men who are coming back to serve once again as deacons. They've served uh, in the past and rotated off and then were renominated. And I'll recognize them because they will be serving the Lord uh, with you and with us, uh, Chris Leon. And we honor Brother Chris and his sweet wife, Linda. And then Brother Jerry Craze and his precious wife, Sonia. And then Brother Dan Ogle and his sweet wife, Amy. And then Shane Hall, his dear wife, Renee. Eddie Price and his precious wife, Kim. Steve Holder and his wonderful wife, Vanya, Vonda, Vonda. So I, I, uh, I said Sonia and had Vanya on my mind. But anyway, I'll get that right. But uh, praise God for each one of these. And uh, we want to, the Bible tells us that uh, the ministry of those who serve as deacons is an honorable ministry in the church. Uh, these men serve in such a wonderful way to uh, to help and to assist me, to lift up my arms in prayer and, uh, and to encourage me, to counsel me and uh, to, to give wisdom and, and then to serve you throughout the body in the church. You know, uh, our deacons of the week, four of them each week, in addition to being available to look in on those who have particular needs, sometimes benevolence needs and other things like that, they also provide additional security for us every Lord's Day. 
uh, they are back around in the hallways and around the children's area, and they just uh, are there to be more eyes and ears uh, on this place uh, for us to be uh, able to worship and to know that, uh, that there are folks that are watching out for us. And, and so there are a number of things that they do. You find uh, many times their names as van drivers. Uh, they go out, pick up folks that are unable to, to transport themselves to church, and they do that. And, and then in just a thousand other ways, visiting our shut-in, sometimes in the hospital with families. And, uh, and then, you know, if the need arises for uh, teaching, for coming up here and delivering a message, or any other number of things that could come up, unexpectedly these are men who stand ready to help us with that and I praise God for them and so men as I lead us in prayer today I'm going to invite you if uh, Chad if if you will come and stand out at the front right there with Christy just a few steps away from the altar so they can get to you and uh, they're going to just pass by as I begin to pray just go ahead and begin to come and uh, let them know that your thoughts and your prayers are with them. And we honor them as they uh, say yes to the service of our King here at Second Baptist. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, how I thank you for this time that we can spend honoring the work and ministry of the deacon. And God, we thank you that in your wisdom and in your providence, Lord, you called out those that will serve you. And it is a calling, Lord, to these men and to their precious wives because they are one flesh together and they come to serve you, to be servants of the living God, to be an example to other believers, Lord, to join with their pastor and just uh, in this great ministry to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, we thank you for each and every one of them. I thank you for their families. I thank you for their children. I thank you for the ones who have precious grandchildren, Lord, and we see so many of them around here on Sunday morning, God, and, and I am grateful, Lord, that you are still touching the heart of people who are willing to serve. Lord, we know as a church family, you have put it in the mind and in the heart of many of our people to present these names of these men and say, we believe after prayer that they could serve well in this capacity. So you put it in the heart of our people to nominate them. And Lord, we're grateful that uh, you, uh, in your wisdom, have also given to us a method of, of meeting with them, speaking with them, talking with them, and knowing their heart, knowing their doctrine, what they believe about your word, and knowing their servant spirit. And each and every one of them has gone through that process that we have been with them and taught with them. We've heard their testimonies of your saving grace, and we've watched in a wonderful way, Lord, as you have prepared them for this hour. God, I honor them today for their willingness to serve. Thank you for our church family. Bless each and every one. God, we pray in the sweet name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much, men. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you, uh, ladies, for allowing your, your husbands the opportunity to come and just serve with us here at Second Baptist. I just love each one of them, and I praise God for them. Take your Bible this morning and be turning with me to the 10th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the 10th chapter. For our scripture reading this morning, we're bringing a, a series of messages on the subject, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth it? You know, the Bible says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. And by definition, that means a disciple is one who identifies with the Savior in his death. We proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins. He has shed blood for us. We identify with him in his glorious resurrection. And even as Christ died and was raised again, when I was wonderfully saved, God raised me spiritually to new life in Christ. And we proudly proclaim that to the world. We believe that Jesus is the only Savior and the only way to heaven. 
Now, if we're going to be disciples, there is a cost. There is a demand. There is a design for discipleship, a cost of commitment. There really is. And, and so we ask the question, is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? Now, Nick Ripkin talks so much about what many believers are enduring around the world. He talked about that. And so we ask ourselves the question, is Jesus worth it? What if he calls on us to give our life for his cause? What if it means our very life? Is he worth it? Would you do that? Would you die for him? I submit many would not die for him because they really won't live for him. You'll never die for him unless you're willing first to live for him. Well, this is the great adventure that the Lord has called us to. And I'm bringing a message this morning entitled, The Adventure of a Lifetime. The adventure of a lifetime. Now, you know, we all like an adventure, don't we? we? We like an adventure. There's something about an adventure that just sort of fires us up, gets the juices flowing, gets us all excited. Now, some adventures, some of them are overwhelming. I'll be honest with you, they're overwhelming. I have dreamed for a long time. I'd have the opportunity one day to build me a library where that's my, you know, men, men have a, a he shed. I've heard of she sheds and he sheds. We know men have, they have their workstations. They have their places they like to go. And for a preacher, his workstation, his tool house is his study. And so, you know, I, I took that on. Debbie said, let's do it. And I ordered wood for bookcases and they delivered it and I almost fainted. I thought, good night. What have I done? I mean, I bit off more than I can chew. And by God's grace, you know, I, I had some fellows that stepped up. A couple of, three of them just said, pastor, let, let us help you. And so uh, Brother Frank left Co and even his wife, Lynn. I mean, they just showed up and worked. And then, and, and then I thank God for John May and his sweet wife, Linda, sweet folks in our church. John said, let me help you. These guys know what they're doing. And then a new fellow in our church, Dale Mead, his wife, Grace, God sent him all the way from Rochester, New York, because he knew I needed help. And y'all knew I needed help too. And now the Lord is sending people all the way from New York to try to help me. And by the way, we're still involved and probably will be till about Christmas. So any of you guys that like to have a blessing, come and join us. We have a good time. And you know, these guys are doing a great job, even though I'm there trying to help them. And you know, they have to overcome a lot because when I hammer anything, it's mostly my thumb. But anyway, that's an overwhelming adventure. Now, some adventures are pre planned, aren't they? I mean, just like the Vol games that last night at Neyland Stadium when UT played. Well, you know, people plan for that. Folks come up on the river, the Vol Navy. They, they float down the water and, and come to a Vol game. They drive from sometimes even out of state or they fly in. They're going to be here for the Tennessee Volunteers. They plan for it. Some of them come in time for the Vol Walk and all of those things because they, they look forward to it. They bought their tickets. They're ready. It's a pre-planned adventure. Now, some adventures are unplanned. They really are. We come in, I think it was one of those nights after Nick Ripkin, we came in the other night and I hadn't even sat down. I just walking into the den and, and Debbie decided to open the front door and she had put one of those fall things you hang on your door and apparently a bird decided that was going to be a nest for it. Because she opened the front door of the house and all at once my back was turned to her and I heard a war whoop. I mean, whoo, 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 whoo. I mean, it scared me to death. I thought some man had come in the house and like any self-respecting husband, I was trying to find a place to hide. <laughs> but anyway, she, she, I realized she was saying, a bird's in the house, a bird's in the house. Now, if you've never had a bird fly in your house, for the next 20 minutes, me and Josh were trying to corral that bird. It was like Clark W. Griswold and Cousin Eddie trying to get a hold of a squirrel. I mean, if y'all have seen it, you'd have busted out laughing. I, we were crazy. We were chasing that squirrel everywhere. I mean, squirrel. Might as well have been a squirrel. That's God. I tell you what, it's a bird. But anyway, I found out I'm not a bird whisperer, that's for sure. But that was an unplanned adventure. But, and by the way, I've checked it off my bucket list. I, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> I really don't. But anyway, but, but, but I love an adventure. Well, I want to tell you about it, the adventure of a lifetime. The adventure of a lifetime. And it was pre-planned, but not just when you were born. 
I'm telling you, it was pre-planned before you ever were born. If you're a child of the king, God has called you to a glorious adventure. It is planned by the Lord. It is appointed by him. Now, it can be overwhelming at times, but it is the adventure of a lifetime. That's what he was talking about in Matthew chapter 10. And I'll be honest with you, these verses, when we read them together, we don't preach very often from these verses in the Scripture. I didn't find just a whole lot of times that folks would preach on it because, to be honest with you, as you read it, you think, wow, what does that mean? How does that apply to me? But I want you to read it with me, and I want you to see what God... Now, you remember last week, or the week before last, before Brother Nick came, we preached on the 12 that the Lord appointed as apostles, the master's men, those that were the disciples. And we preached from the first five verses about these men and the uh, calling God had placed on their life. Well, we take up uh, with verse, well, let's take up with verse number five, where the Bible says this, these 12 Jesus sent out. Jesus sent them out. Now get that in your head. And he commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his, of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter into, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into the household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or from that city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, we look here together at the Lord's calling upon these apostles, these early 12, and we naturally want to ask ourselves, all right, how does that apply to me? Now, I find, first of all, I find the design of discipleship very clearly taught here in the Word of God. God saves us in order to send us. God saves us in order to send us. In other words, God calls us out of darkness into His light. That's salvation. We were called out of darkness into his light. And then God sends us back out into the darkness with his light. Did you hear me? He calls us out of darkness into his glorious light. And then he sends us back out into the darkness with his light. To shine his light. And that's what it means to be sent. The Bible says that Jesus sent out these twelve, these apostles... Now, I do believe, as Nick Ripkin said last week, and I've always believed this, I believe that everything that Jesus has done, he can still do it today. I believe that. Everything Jesus has done, he can still do it today. But now, I do not believe that everything he told these men to do still applies to us in the exact same way. And you need to understand that because some of the things they did applied particularly to them. God has a unique calling upon every life. They were called to be apostles. Now there are some even today who claim to be apostles. Well, in the New Testament understanding of that word, the apostles were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. 
You say, what about Paul? He wasn't an eyewitness. Well, yes, he was. Jesus appeared to him and called him to be an apostle. So they were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And so they were apostles and God validated their ministry and affirmed their ministry through certain signs and wonders that he did through them. And that was something that was unique for that time and for that moment. Now, Jesus can do anything he chooses to do. But, for example, there was one Calvary. There's not going to be another Calvary. Jesus will never go back to the cross and be put to death again on the cross. That was a one-time occurrence. There was one Pentecost. There's not going to be another Pentecost. The Holy Spirit of God has come and still is at work in our world today. And so there was one Pentecost. So these apostles had a unique calling that the Lord placed on their lives. And I don't believe that everything they did is exactly the same for us. But we'll explain a little bit more about that later. But I do want to say some things about what it means to be a disciple, a follower on this adventure of a lifetime. And just like Jesus gave to Peter and James and John and one after another, his apostles, he sent them out on an adventure that would arrest them the rest of their life. I mean, it would change their destiny and their life. And Jesus has done the same for us. He's called us to a great adventure. So several things I want to say about every believer. Number one, every believer is a minister of the gospel. Did you hear me? Every believer is a minister, minister of the gospel. You are to have a ministry just as I have a ministry, every believer is a minister of the gospel. Now, I do believe in a vocational calling to service for the king. I believe that. Uh, I experienced that in my life, a vocational calling. That is God's will. It was God's will for my life. Uh, it happened when I just had turned 15 years old. I was at Samuel Place Baptist Church on a Sunday night. And like most 15-year-olds, I probably didn't pay very much attention to the message because I have no clue what was preached. I couldn't begin to tell you the sermon that was preached. I know my dad preached it. That's all I remember. But that, I, I don't remember what was preached. But I remember that when the invitation time came, something happened to me that I'm more sure of than I am sure I'm standing here this morning. I'm more sure of it than anything in this world, and that is I know that God spoke to me. I looked around at the uh, kids that were sitting by me. I think I asked one or two of them, did y'all hear God say something? God didn't say nothing to us. He did to me, and he called me to his ministry. I, I walked the aisle, got on my face before God. And a 15-year-old boy broke down and just began to cry like a baby. I, I mean, I, you know, I was embarrassed almost and I was so broken, but it happened. It happened to me. God called me to that ministry. Now, everybody's not called to vocational ministry. There are folks that are called to be doctors and attorneys and, and nurses and teachers and any number of other things, and God has called you to it. But we all have one thing totally in common. And that is that every believer is a minister of the gospel. Now, when it comes to vocational ministry and the general calling to ministry, I think we've done a great disservice in the church that we have, we have too great a divide in that. We have a, a misunderstanding the, between the two callings. You say, how do you mean that, preacher? Well, this is just God's will for my life. It doesn't make me one ounce any better than anybody else in the church. I'm no more important than anybody else in the church. And, and, and God doesn't smile on me any more than he does anybody else in the church. I have the same struggles you do. I have the same problems. I have the same fears and concerns and things that happen in my life. I have all of that. Everything you have, I have it as well. And every one of us are equally vital. No one more important than anybody else in the household of faith. It's just that God, in whatever, for whatever reason, God just said, all right, you're going to preach the gospel, and you're going to do that. And I either had to say yes or no, and I didn't want to disobey him, so I said yes. And God called me that. I'm grateful that he did. But you, too, are a minister of the gospel. You really are. Then there's a second thing I want to say about every believer. Not only is every believer a minister of the gospel, every believer's ministry 
is to be a ministry of obedience. Did you hear me? Every believer's ministry is to be a ministry of obedience. Notice the Bible says these 12 Jesus sent out and, what's the next word? Commanded them. And commanded them. You might say, well, well, who was Jesus to command? Well, he's the Lord of lords, amen? He is Lord, he is king. The most important title, I guess, if you think about des- describing who Jesus is, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word Lord, I mean, that means he's the boss. We all understand that, don't you? You go to work, you, you, if you have a boss at work, What does that boss do? Well, when you're at work, that boss tells you what you're supposed to do. He tells you that you do this, you do the other, and if you value your job, you do it because he's the boss. And you understand that. You have no problem as long as he's the boss. Now, Jesus is our master. He is the boss. He is the one in charge. He truly are. And we are to obey our commander-in-chief. We're supposed to obey him. He has the right. He died for us. He purchased us with his own blood. And that's why the Bible says you are no longer your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body which belongs to the Lord. And so he has a right to command us. And he gave them a commandment. Matter of fact, one of the most disturbing and challenging questions that Jesus ever asked was in Luke 6.46. Jesus asked this question. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Did you hear me? Why do you call me Lord when you're not going to do what I say? In other words, biblical New Testament Christianity is always defined as a ministry of obedience. We are to obey the Lord. I think it's a foreign thing, though it's not foreign in our churches. It's foreign to the Bible. You know, when somebody will say, somebody says, well, you know, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm, I know I'm saved. I know I've got my fire insurance policy. I, I know I'm going to heaven. I, I remember praying that prayer. I know I'm saved, but just don't ask me to do anything there in the church. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get involved and do anything. Now, folks, that's foreign to the Word of God. There's nothing in that that even resembles what being a disciple of Jesus is. Somebody that would say, well, I'm saved, but I don't intend to do anything. I'll come to church, but but I'm not going to do anything else. No, I won't teach that class. I won't drive that van. I'll not not help take up the offering. I'll not do this. I'll not do the other. I don't want to be in the choir. I don't, you know, I mean, that's foreign to what our Lord has taught a disciple to be. He's the owner. He's the Lord. So if he calls you, he's called you to a ministry of obedience. I found a little book I just started called The Unsaved Christian. I was intrigued by the title because I thought, okay, if they're a Christian, how could they be unsaved? Well, I quickly discovered that what the person was talking about, the author, he was talking about this phenomena in America that is way, way too common of cultural Christianity. You know that 50% of the people of America claim that they are Christians. They, well, they've prayed a prayer. They've done that. They've walked an aisle. There are some folks that point back to years ago. Well, I was a little boy or girl. I walked an aisle at Bible school, and I prayed this prayer. And now, they're living just like the devil right now. I mean, they're not in obedience to anything God says. They're, they're doing all kinds of stuff that God says not to do. But they'll tell you, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Folks, I wouldn't want to take that kind of Christianity to the judgment. I wouldn't want to do it. Why do you think the Bible so often pictures those who thought they were saved really not being saved? You know, the Bible, Jesus time after time he tells some story or some illustration that proves that he's talking about someone who thought they got it and they didn't he tells about the wheat and tares on the outside they look just alike on the outside you can't tell any difference but there is a difference one is empty on the inside while the other has life and Jesus said let them both grow together at the judgment they'll be separated 
He was talking about those who claim something they, they don't possess. They are cultural Christians, the unsaved Christian. What about the, the story of the, the guests who showed up for the wedding and some didn't have the right, one didn't have the right wedding garment on. He was thrown out. You're not wearing the right wedding garment. Again, showed up expecting to be a part of it all. No. What about the five foolish virgins? Five wise with oil in their lamps, all representing the Holy Spirit. The five foolish, they thought, hey, you know, we, the, when, when we're going we're to be included. They weren't. What about when Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name done many great works? And the Lord will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, I could point to so many different illustrations in the Bible directly from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ of those who expected. They expected they were going to heaven. They expected what they had was real. They thought they were, oh, I've got my fire insurance policy. But folks, listen, there's more to Christianity than one time just saying, well, yes, I'll, I'll pray a prayer if that's all I have to do. No, if you're going to be saved, you trust Christ as your Savior and Lord. Yes, do I believe in leading someone to pray and confess Jesus? Yes. But I also believe that you tell them the rest of the story. And that is, if you truly are saved, you are saying, Jesus is Lord of my life. He is Lord of my You give your life to him. And so the, the believer's ministry, if it's real, it is a ministry of obedience. One time, Peter said these words to Jesus. Jesus made a statement, and Peter said, Not so, Lord. Can you imagine telling Jesus, Not so, Lord? I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a foolish statement. How could you ever say, Not so, Lord? If he's Lord, whatever he asks, whatever he says is so. It always is. You don't ever have to say, Not so, Jesus. Not so, Lord. Whatever he commands, we have a ministry of obedience. So what is he commanded? Well, the first commandment that Jesus gives to every true disciple, the very first commandment is to follow him in believer's baptism. To follow him in believer's baptism, which pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Believer's baptism, the very first command of the Lord. Yet I know people that profess to be Christians. Well, I'm saved, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to be baptized. I don't really feel like I need to be baptized. Now again, the Bible knows nothing about that as, as being something that is genuine and real. If you are saved, you say, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And the very first thing he says to do is to be baptized. You are identifying with him in his death and in his resurrection. You see, some folks have the attitude, well, now, preacher, I, I'm going to obey the Lord partially. I, you know, I believe that partial obedience is, is, is good. No, 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 partial obedience is disobedience. May I say that again? Partial obedience is disobedience. Whenever God reveals something to us, we are to do what he says because he is our Lord. He's the commander. Can you imagine, ladies? Here's a man who says, now, honey, I'm going to be faithful to you 364 nights a year. I promise you, 364 nights a year, I'm going to be faithful. Now, one night a year, I'm going to go to somebody else, and I'm going to have one night with somebody else. Now, would you think that, well, that's, that, yeah, that's okay. I, I, I can handle that. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, he'd come back, probably get a skillet over the head, and maybe some other things, you know. Because you see, faithfulness is not faithfulness 364 nights a year. It's faithfulness 365 nights and days a year. Amen? That's what it is. Every believer is a minister of the gospel. Every believer's ministry is to be a ministry of obedience. But, but notice something else from this text. Every believer has a ministry to lost people. Every believer has a ministry to lost people. Do you know that Jesus said here to these apostles, he said, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter a seat of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep 
of the house of Israel. This is where the gospel begins. Jesus, now hear me now, this is where the unique calling of these apostles at that particular moment. Jesus presented himself as the king of the Jews. You understand? He presented himself as the king of the Jews. He was from the lineage of David. That means he was from the direct line of David. He is the rightful king over Israel. That's how he presented himself. He didn't present himself as the king of Rome. By the way, he didn't present himself as the king of America or the king of Great Britain or the king of China. He presented himself as the king of Israel and they were to go first to the lost sheep of Israel and declare what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Israel had their opportunity. Jesus said, I've come to you. You have your opportunity. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says he came to his own, but his own received him not. As a matter of fact, they cried out at the trial of Jesus, we have no king but Caesar. Imagine, they'd have rather had the Romans over them. They'd have rather had King Caesar than King Jesus. And so I'm here today not proclaiming the, the kingdom as much as I am proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is yet future. The kingdom of God is prophetic. The Lord will come again to establish his earthly kingdom. Israel, their eyes will be opened to who the true king is, and that's yet future. I am here proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the savior of all the world. Later on, after they rejected him, Jesus will give the great commission to his disciples, beginning in Jerusalem, and then he says, go into Judea, into Samaria. So he was not ignoring those people. He came first to Israel. Now he expands on that. Israel rejected him. Now, what do we draw out of that? Here's what we draw out of it. Our ministry is to the lost. It's to lost people. God has called us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are unsafe. Now, immediately we have to ask ourselves an important question. I tell you all the time, you read the Bible, you ask questions of the Bible. So what is the question then? The question I ask is, what does it mean to be lost? If we are called to lost people, what does it really mean to be lost? Now, the truth of the matter is, some of us have been in church all our lives. I, I tell you, I've been in church since nine months before I was born. All of my life I've been in church. So we've been in church so long, sometimes we almost forget that there are people that are lost. And they don't understand anything about what we're doing. And they have no appreciation and no appetite for it, no desire for it, because they are lost. What does it mean to be lost? Now, get this in your heart, please. To be lost, first of all, means to be spiritually dead. It means to be spiritually dead. The Bible says that before I was saved, I was dead in trespasses and sins. You say, well, preacher, when it says spiritually dead, I don't fully understand that. You remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. You remember when the Lord told them, he walked with them each day, fellowship with them. They had perfect fellowship with the Lord God of heaven who created them. I mean, they weren't ashamed before the Lord. They, they, they could fellowship with him daily. The Lord gave them one command, and he said, the, the tree in the center of the garden, do not eat of that tree. The day that you do, you will surely die. You remember that? And then what did they do? They disobeyed God. They ate of that tree that God told them. You say, was it an apple tree? Was it I don't know. That's not important. It's not even important what, what God had told them other than God said, you're to do this, and they disobeyed God. That was the story. They disobeyed God. So they ate of that tree that God said, don't eat from. And what happened? They died. You say, well, well how did they die? Listen, every one of us, you are body, soul, and spirit. You understand? You are body, soul, and spirit. You have a body. You have a physical body. With that physical body, you, you feel touch. You feel thirst. You taste. You hear. You see. You have a physical body. If someone pinches you, you might holler. 
because you feel it. Now, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they still had a physical body. They could still touch. They could still feel. They could still hear and see all of those things. They had a physical body. Their physical body didn't die. They also had a soul. Our soul is how we relate emotionally, how we relate to one another. And so as a living soul, I can relate to you. I see hope, and she's in the Walmart or somewhere else, and wherever you see hope, you're always going to get a big smile and probably a hug. And she's going to talk to you a little bit. And so I know hope, and so I know you. So I see Elizabeth, and I think of her little sweet girls because I have a soul, and that's how we relate to one another emotionally. Adam and Eve, they still had a soul. They could relate to one another. They could talk to one another. That didn't die. But you also have a spirit. And what happened when God came calling in the garden? They ran and hid from God. Because they were conscious that something was wrong. They felt naked and they felt ashamed. They hid from God. They had never done that before. They had never felt any need to do that. They never felt any shame. But they did then. Why? Because their spirit had died. Their spirit had died. To be lost means that spiritually you're dead. You have a physical body, a physical life. You have emotional responses to other people. You may even, you know, I've known some folks that they say, boy, I just love to hear Elvis Presley sing how great they are. They think they're going to heaven because they like it when Elvis Presley sang how great. I had an aunt like that. I mean, Elvis, nobody could sing how great they aren't like Elvis. Well, that's probably true. I tried to sing like Elvis one time. Debbie said, would you shut up, please? You're hurting my ears. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we, we still have emotional, psychological makeup, but spiritually dead. To be lost, you're spiritually dead. That's what that's talking about. But you see, not only is the lost person spiritually dead they're also condemned by God condemned by God separated from God that's what it means to be lost that that awesome verse John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life what a wonderful verse But then the Bible says, he that believes is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. The good news is only good news when we know how bad the bad news is. And the good news of God's grace is good news because once that's where I was, I was condemned already. You know what a lot of people in the world believe? That's why most folk think they're going to heaven. They they believe in their heart. They think, well, one day in the judgment, God's going to take all the good stuff that I did, and I try to do some good things. God will weigh all the good stuff, and then God will take those few bad things, and we have poor memories. We really don't think we did that many bad things. But God will take all the bad things, and God will weigh the balance, and 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 you know the good versus the bad. And if the good outweighs the bad, he'll say, come on in, welcome into heaven. It ain't that way, folks. That's just not true. Nothing true about that. Doesn't matter how many people think that's the way it is. That's not the way it is. The problem is their sentence already awaits them. They are guilty right now. They're condemned by God right this moment. The judgment is just simply the declaration and execution of what that means to be condemned, to be separated from God. If a person is lost, they're already condemned. I have a friend in Texas. I talked to him yesterday, a preacher friend of mine. I called and checked on him just a little bit. And while we were talking, I remember the last time I visited him, he and his wife, Don and Darlene, that's their names, and, and a tornado had blown through on Christmas Eve right through their street and knocked down more than half of the houses. I mean, just, you know, or, or, or compromised them. His house was damaged, but it was not condemned. 
But I remember when I eventually it was right after that tornado, and I drove, and I couldn't hardly recognize the street because one sign after another was put, this property is condemned. This property is condemned. They were going to tear it down because it was so compromised. This property is condemned. But to be condemned by God is even worse. It's even worse. Because to be condemned by God means an eternal separation from God and not being able to go to heaven because I'm spiritually dead and I'm condemned and separated from God. But to be lost also means it means that I would face an eternal hell. I would face an eternal hell. Every lost person, every individual, when we drive out of this building today and we drive over to Charles Savers and you're going to turn to the right or you're going to turn to the left and you're going to see people passing by and you're going to see folks at the service station. Some of them are going to have their boats tied to the back of their vehicle. They're heading for a cold lake today if they head to the lake. But some of them will. You know, they'll, they'll be doing this or the other and so forth. And, and the reality is we need to see them differently than we normally see them. Normally we see them and we don't think that much. But when we see them today, we ought to realize that likely the majority of the people we see, the majority of them, face an eternal hell. They face an eternal hell. You say, well, preacher, you're saying all they're bad people. That just makes me feel like I think I'm superior. No, no, people don't go to heaven because they're good, and they don't go to hell because they're bad. As a matter of fact, the Bible says there's none good. No, not even one. None of us deserves heaven. Heaven is not because we're good enough. Heaven is because we've experienced God's grace. And his mercy and his forgiveness, we've recognized our sin and we've asked God to forgive us of our sins. A person goes to hell not not because they sin more than you. They go to hell because they're condemned and they're separated from a holy God. You say, well, preacher, I I don't believe in eternal hell. You know, uh, dignified preachers don't preach that anymore, you know. No, dignified preachers don't preach in eternal hell. Well, I never have really been accused of being a dignified preacher, but I do believe we ought to be honest. I believe we ought to tell the truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ spoke twice as many times about hell as he did about heaven. If we believe heaven is real, if we believe Jesus tells the truth, why would we call him a liar when he warns about hell? And he says it's eternal. It's eternal because you see to be lost means we do not experience the life and forgiveness of God. Every believer is called to a ministry of obedience, to a ministry of the, to the lost, but every believer also is called to a ministry of power, a ministry of power. I'll close in a few moments, but every believer, notice that Jesus said to these apostles, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out demons. You say, well, preacher, what do we do with that? I mean, do we do, we do all those things? Is that for us? Do we do that? Well, I believe that what Jesus spoke to these apostles here primarily were signed gifts at that moment. Now, you say, what does that mean, preacher? Here's what I mean by that. Now, go back to what I said. Everything that Jesus has ever done, he can do. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that. Everything he's ever done, he can do. But at the same time, Notice that when Jesus gave this commission to his apostles, they didn't take their Bibles, the Old Testament and the New Testament, in their hands and go out into the streets and lanes with their Bibles in their hands. Why? Because they didn't have one. They didn't have it. God had not finished his fully revealed divine holy word. So he authenticated the ministry of these eyewitnesses to his resurrection. He said to them, go out, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Any of you been cleansing any lepers lately? I never have even met one. To be honest, I know that they are. They, there are people that are lepers. I never have seen any of them around here. He said, raise the dead. Anybody here ever raise the dead? You ever do that? There have been times I've wanted to. I've been in the hospital. Listen, I was in the hospital with one of my sweet families some years ago. Their little grandson, little grand, eight-day-old little boy was dying. I stood in the hospital. That little baby died. 
I would have done anything in this world. I, I wish that I could have put my hand on that little baby and said, Oh, God, would you raise this dead little body and raise and give him life again? By the way, if you could do that and you wouldn't do that, you're more immoral than any agnostic or atheist I've ever met. Heal the sick. You say, preacher, do you believe in divine healing? Absolutely. I've said it before. I believe that's the only kind of healing there is, is divine healing. I believe that. But I don't believe these fellows that get on there and with a television camera and they, they got the camera on them and they said, hey, if you, you invest in my ministry, you send this money, you do this, you know, I'm going to pray this, this cloth and anoint you and this and you'll be healed. No, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe in these false teachers. Now listen, I don't believe in these false teachers. I don't. I expose them. I don't believe in them. Now, the Bible teaches, get this, this is a very important Bible lesson. The Bible teaches the gifts, plural, of healing. Not the gift of healing, the gifts, plural, of healing. And there's a distinction. The gifts, you say, what does that mean, preacher? It means this, there's not a person, that I don't care who, Benny Hinn, whoever the rest, there's not a person who has the gift of healing that's different or in any way than anything that you as a believer could exercise. Nobody has that. And by the way, I wanna, I'd want i ask any one of them, if that person can pray and speak a word and, and a person be healed, I'm going to take them down to Children's Hospital and they're going to empty that hospital. Why should a little baby suffer and die if I have a gift to go and heal them? Amen? Now, why would I send a nickel to somebody that's a phony and a fraud? I'm not going to do it. No. Nobody has that kind of gift. The apostles were given that gift, and even they could not heal all the time. God authenticated there. He authenticated their message. The Bible wasn't completed. What do we have now? We have the Word of God, and it is authenticated by the resurrection. And there is no greater tool, no greater power, no greater sign that God could ever work in this world greater than the Word of God. And by the way, why make a distinction? God also said to them, raise the dead. Now, suppose I announced and I got the word out, Knoxville, well, I have now the gift to raise the dead. I can raise the dead. And I go down to the funeral home and I raise some dead people. There's a lot of families who would love it if I could raise the dead person back to life. Now, I want to tell you something. We would not have one service in a building anywhere near half full we would, not, we would have to have six or eight services every Sunday and every seat would be packed and people would be waiting to get in because they would want to come and see the man that could raise the dead. Amen? You'd show, I'd show up. When my dad died, I would love to be able to say, Lord, I, I just by my power, I raise, through your power, I raise him from the dead. No, no, no. No, no. But you say, can God heal? Absolutely. There are gifts of healing. There are times, listen, there are times. You may, you may go to the hospital. Miss Dolly, well, what a prayer warrior. You may go to the hospital. This has happened to me, and I believe this. You may go to the hospital, and that person is suffering. And the Holy Spirit of God may speak very clearly to you. Pray for them, because my desire to heal them. Pray for them. And you pray, and you say, now, and by the way, the Bible says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church that they might come and pray over you and anoint you with oil. The prayer of faith saves the sick, heals the sick. And God may say, pray over that person, and you do. Do I believe God can heal them? Absolutely. I've seen him do it. I've watched him do it. Not a doubt in my mind. If I face someone that was a leper and God said, uh, put your hand on them and touch them, I can heal them. And if God said it and I knew he said it, I believe God can heal them. There's nothing that Jesus once did that he cannot do. But no person has the gift of healing that they can just do that. And if they did, they have a cure for cancer right then through that person. And by the way, if I could do those things, people would flock to this building, but not to hear the word of God, not to appreciate what Jesus did, but to see the person that could do those things. Yeah. That's, I'm just telling you the truth. Amen. Every, I believe in a ministry of power. By the way, I also believe every believer is called to a ministry of faith. He said, freely you've been given, freely give. 
In other words, God did not give us something to get rich over it, to draw, get money out of it, so people will buy us an airplane or something else. God did not. He said, don't carry gold or silver or a, a, a purse. The King James uses the word script. The script was a little bag that a beggar would use. And the Lord was saying, listen, he said, I've given to you freely. And you are to freely share your ministry. You're to do that. And yet he also said, as you go, you don't have to be a beggar. As a pastor, I'm glad. I don't believe I should have to be a beggar. I believe that's why the Bible says the workman is worthy of his food, of his hire. Because when we're ministering the word of God, we have no right to be greedy, but we have a right to trust that God will meet our needs. And I believe that. God will meet your needs. God will take care of if you obey him. Some of you might say, I think God's calling me to the mission field, but I'm afraid my needs won't be met. Then you're not trusting God. God will meet your needs if he's calling you. It is a ministry of faith. And then every believer is called to a ministry of discernment. He said, you go in the house, and if it's worthy, salute it. Stay there. If it's not, shake off the dust from your feet. What does that mean? It has to do with the discernment. In that day, they didn't have a you know, Holiday Inn Express or, or, you know, they didn't have Hampton Inn or anything. They didn't have anything like that. You come into a home and you go to a home and you go use discernment, use wisdom. There are places as believers we have to be careful about. There are places I don't need to go in. As a believer, there are things I need to be careful about. And that means discernment. And finally, every believer is called to a ministry that is urgent. It is urgent. It really is. Look at verses 15 and 16, and I, I'll close with this. Verses 15 and 16. Assuredly, I say to you, be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What is the Lord saying? The Lord is saying what we have, the gospel, is more important, more priceless than anything. We go out. It's urgent that we go out. It's urgent that we go out. We need to do it now for the glory of God. Would you bow your head with me? Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the joy of sharing it this morning. And God, I pray that you will open our hearts to your wonderful truth. Lord, that means in this invitation time, God, I believe that you're speaking to individuals right now. You're speaking to some dads and some moms. You're speaking to husbands, wives, and children, young people. Lord, there are things in our life that we need to get right with you. For some, they've never settled the question of salvation. Maybe they've experienced cultural Christianity. They claim to be a believer, but they never do anything about it. And they realize today, God, I don't have the real thing. I want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to follow no matter the cost. Lord, I pray if there are those who recognize that today, that God, this day, this moment, might be the moment they trust in you as their Lord and Savior. Let them receive you by faith into their heart and trust you and see what it means to truly be saved. God, I lift up those who are here that you're calling them to a walk of obedience and you're commanding them to trust you. God, I pray that they'll get victory in that and say yes to you today. And whatever, whatever matter it is, if there's a sin issue in our lives, help us to deal with it, God. Honestly and truthfully before a holy God, we ask in Jesus' name.